Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to our institution of Global Professional Free International Webinar. Thank you all for joining with us in this marvelous session, and I hope you stay with us till the program ends. And time to time, you like our Facebook page and subscribe our YouTube channel for upcoming information. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to be associated with IGP as a global member. And I feel honored to host this webinar, and it's my delight to welcome you all to our institution of Global Professional Free International Webinar. Once again, I am Kamdun, coordinator of IGP from Bangladesh. Dear participants, today we have a speaker from Philippines. And today our webinar name is Research in Linguistic Landscape. We are sorry to say that we can connect with our speaker for some technical problem. But we can manage a video about this topic. So we run our video only today. And after that, uh, we have quiz competition. And after that, we share our certification process. Let's we enjoy our video. course to our Institute of Global Professionals. I also give my warmest um, gratitude for also considering me as one of the pool of your speakers in this prestigious learning platform. With that, ladies and gentlemen, let us continue our discussion by first Let's try to give an answer, a concrete answer on these a million dollar question. What is a linguistic landscape? Now with that, ladies and gentlemen, please utilize our comment boxes or our comment box to interact with me virtually with these questions that I shall be posing once in a while in my PowerPoint presentations okay so the first question that i have for you my dear colleagues is what is a linguistic landscape or let us put it this way what words phrases concepts or ideas are coming into your minds when you hear the word or the concept linguistic landscape which we will be using actually the abbreviation or i'm sorry about that the mnemonics or acronym ll to stand for linguistic landscape okay while you're chatting your ideas on our comment boxes i appreciate that let me proceed to the first uh to the different definitions of a linguistic landscape now the first one my dear colleagues is linguistic landscape or the ll refers to any display of visible written language therefore we're practically we're practically dealing with signages or sign boards okay and another definition from laundry and bars in 1997 linguistic landscape refers to the visibility and salience of languages on public and commercial signs, okay? And of course, other definitions from Warter back in 2006, he defined linguistic landscape as mainly focusing on the use of language in its written form in public spaces. Other definitions are also presented to us about linguistic landscape and that includes this definition linguistic landscape refers to all visible semiotic signs in public spaces this is not only including printed a written carved sprayed or otherwise visible language that occurs in the physical world but also linguistic landscape will 
include pictures, colors, logos, graphs, and other meaningful signs. So linguistic landscape is the ensemble of such semiotic signs that constitutes the linguistic landscape of a given locality. Other definitions from other, uh, from still from Landry and Boris back in 1997, they again defined LL as the language of public road signs, advertising billboards, street names, place names, commercial shop signs, and public signs on government buildings that combine to form the linguistic landscape of a given territory, region, or urban agglomeration. So when you talk about linguistic landscape, we're particularly dealing with the language and how the language was used on the sign boards or signages in public places or in public areas and i must say this is actually an emerging topic for linguists language teachers and other disciplines also okay so there are a lot of names for linguistic landscape one of which is actually uh, for others they term it as the form of public life others would also term LL as linguistic items found in public space, okay? Or other names would be environmental print, the world, the words on the walls, and the word on the street, okay? Now, another question. Since we already have formally defined what a linguistic landscape is, signs are actually essential components of it. So my next question would be what signs could be considered in linguistic landscape studies okay and that brings me now to actually giving you this okay there is uh, this is actually readily available via the internet you only have to key in that title what's in a sign by linkscape and it will actually provide you a lot of different samples and different kinds of signages or signboards and that could actually be a very good um source of knowledge and further understanding about linguistic landscape in any point of time that we decide to make one okay so according to this uh, source public signs and lettering can be divided into different types according to the design choice and arrangement of languages official status or pragmatic organization or what we call now as the inter alia these are different linguistic graphic and pragmatic elements contribute to the often complex uh, sem semiotic constitution of signs and therefore offer a rich potential for analysis, especially regarding the implicit meanings and social positioning that are conveyed with the signs. So it's actually opening our mind, okay, to understand that the signages that we see in different private or public spaces or rural or urban areas are not a mere signboards okay but the fact that they use the language they are still in a platform of communication and with the use of the language they're telling us uh, directions they're giving us essential information but that uh, responsibly type See, responsibility doesn't end there because the linguistic landscape is trying to open our mindset to understand that signages and signboards are actually rich potential sources for analysis okay they are actually valid materials for further analysis now analysis on what we can actually use these signages for linguistic analysis like let's try to study the role of the language in the community that's the linguistic uh, portion of our analysis and that's still governed by what we call now as linguistic landscape or we can also study how the graphics or the visual um, icons or 
yeah icons or symbols okay work together to complement the message in our signages that could also be one of our foci for linguistic landscape studies and we also try to research on how people perceive okay these information or these languages written or inscripted on our sign boards would also be a potential point of study and all these things, my dear colleagues, are actually governed by the concept of linguistic landscape, okay? For what? Because probably these languages that are being used on our signages and how they complement with the different designs, layout, or icons in these signboards would be invested to a certain implicit meaning that concerns the people in the community, or they would actually illustrate a social information, such as a social positioning in the community okay now of course when you speak of science which is a uh, very important in a linguistic landscape study the the two general categories of science would be first the offline sign so when you say it's an offline sign it would actually uh, it's non-technical it's non-technological or it's non um internet based okay they are actually the literal notice boards that we see on our in our communities the traffic signs could also be included the billboards the shop windows the posters the flags the banners the graffitis the menus the t-shirts the tattoos and the more others but when you say it's an online sign they are actually any information that we post on different social networking sites like facebook twitter instagram blogs website and a lot more now ladies and gentlemen all of these studies in the past when you talk about linguistic landscape they are have languages now later on in our signages or sound sign boards after this discussion let's try to observe in our communities um, there are signages that may be bilingualizing meaning that's using two uh, languages or trilingual uh, trilingualizing meaning using three languages or sign boards are generally multilingual there are also sign boards that are generally monolingual so they are actually speaking about the prominence and dominance of different languages in a certain community it would also give us a picture that if one language is only um there is only one language being used by all of the sign boards in a certain setting that would actually give us an idea that there is a big possibility that the community is really monolingual okay or if all the sign boards in a certain setting are all bilingual or multilingual bigger chances are the community is composed of a multilingual and a multicultural a group of people or residents right so that's the wisdom behind the linguistic landscape and i think it's um important okay to know linguistic landscape also reveals much about our culture history and politics of people in different places linguistic landscape is also important because it is one of the many ways that people mark territory actively including some people while excluding the others okay now um, let's try to continue our discussion by looking at this chart okay so the linguistic landscape is actually an opportunity for every one of us to cultivate what a lot we have linguistic which means we through our signboards and signages we can actually formulate or acquire new vocabulary or lexicon. We can also understand uh, words in different meanings or new meanings. And we can also use um, our old vocab. We can exercise our grammatical knowledge, our metaphorical knowledge, and at the same time, our structures of meaning. Okay, those are for linguistic purposes. But languages, um, linguistic landscape may also cultivate our pragmatic knowledge that is analyzing how language is used to do things and make, invite, or suggest 
people to do things. Um, also in pragmatic, we are concerned about the use of language for practical applications, okay? We also have intercultural um, aspect, multimodal, multiliterate, and of course, we use linguistic landscape to cultivate our critical, social, cultural, and reflective thinking skills, okay? Cultivate new ways of looking at, questioning, and challenging the ordinary. So in general, um, in a nutshell, when one does a linguistic landscape, we are actually developing, cultivating, and empowering many competencies or language competencies or language skills in a certain individual. Now, um, hence, we can say that linguistic landscape studies are vital for first multilingualism. As I was saying a while back, there may be signages that are monolingual, so it would actually speak on behalf of the community, or some of the language signages or signboards in certain spots or settings would mix different languages together on one signage alone and it's going to be the trend therefore it's actually reflective or representative of the multicultural and multilingual profile of a community at the same time ll studies are also vital for determining the dominance of languages or prominence of languages like in terms of funds what if the, a certain signage is actually using um, um, three or two mo or more languages on just one signage, okay? And which uh, one goes first, which one is being blown up or having a bigger font style for font size for more emphasis and all those considerations would actually point to uh the prominence or dominance of languages what if this is language that are very common very popular uh, for all the people in the community so this language has to come first on our signage followed by the other um languages that are being spoken in the community but in a less dominant manner okay or um we can also say that linguistic landscape studies are vital for language policies so what rules what regulations what ideas and concepts could be implement institutionalize or institute uh, install for people in the community such that we could have a decision as to what language could we install as our official language for communication okay in which this language will reflect the community and also with aid or communication of the people in the community, okay? So those are our concerns for the LL studies. Now, from those understanding, let's try to answer these questions. What are the salient questions in doing an LL study, okay? So if you are like me, who is aspiring to produce more linguistic landscape studies in the future, these questions would actually be our guiding light. So these questions would include first, how many and what languages occur on science in a specific public space? But Sir Kevin, uh, how do we choose the public space where we will conduct our LL study? Well, we will get to know those are research sites or potential public spaces later on. But the key idea on the first question is that try to observe your signboards and signages in your communities. Uh, what languages? Is there only one language that's being used and what language is that? Or in possibilities of using more than one languages on your signboards, what languages are these? Okay. And in 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 which uh, public spaces? Are these multi signboards present? And in which public spaces are these monolingual signages present? Okay. Second salient question Are the signs monolingual? Are they bilingual, such as two languages? Or are they multilingual, like more than two languages? And in what ways do these signboards? Uh, combine these languages in, in, in case, okay? 
third salient question is, are different languages used for different contents and in different domains, okay? Or in what forms do signs occur? At the same time, what about the language in terms of normativity, orthography, handwriting conventions, lexicon, syntax, and literacy level? Okay, so all these things are guiding questions in conducting a linguistic landscape studies later on. Okay, now let's try to answer another question. What are the possible research sites or locales if we want to conduct a linguistic landscape study? So the first one is, let's try to understand the concept of indexicality. Okay, this is actually a more in-depth analysis and interpretation of the different signs. Okay, so we're trying to look at deeper layers of meaning okay probably these words that are being used on our sign words and signages have certain meanings such as this okay or these words are connected to the different words that are also found in the same on, on the same signage or sign board and when we try to scope those layers um, we connect the signs that can explain what they refer to in addition to the referential meaning. Probably they have these meanings that are invested to political aspects, or there will also be like um, layers of meaning that are related to social aspects, to cultural aspects, to linguistic aspects that constrain the community as a whole, okay? So we try to delve on the concept of indexicality. Now, in terms of research sites, when one wishes to conduct a linguistic landscape, what could be the best spot to conduct such a study? So the first one, according to experts, is that public transport access okay because of course definitely it's a crowded place definitely there will be a lot of signages or signboards to queue the people in the place so first one for Paul back in 1978 he examined the dis back in 2013 carried out this ethnographic linguistic landscape fieldwork in Antwerp, Belgium, in the neighborhood where he himself lives, okay? Now, um, choosing our survey area or research site for the linguistic landscape study is admittedly problematic, okay? On, of course, challenging. But um, for some researchers that uh, researches that were already published in as far as linguistic landscape studies concerned, uh, we can actually utilize the power of the internet or the new media, okay? Now, the new media introduces to us the Google Street View, okay? So for us uh, LL researchers later on, we can use the Google Street View and it's uh, highly recommended by POSI uh, back in 2015 because it enables the users to scout for linguistic landscape or of distant or less accessible areas viewing panoramic images along routes around the world okay we also have another question here what are the units of analysis in doing the linguistic landscape studies now if we say units of analysis to what scope, okay? Because when you talk about signages, uh, signages will just be all around the different corners of a certain community, okay? The question is, what are our limits, okay? What are our um, spaces? What is the scope, okay? Where exactly in a certain community will we uh, um, gather the signages to study for a linguistic landscape, okay? The first one is, um that is um other researchers would highly suggest that linguistic landscape studies could focus first on the establishment so for example on my case if i wish to do a linguistic landscape study 
on a certain public market, I will only, of course, the best idea is to only choose one a public market in your area and then all of the signs inside this a premise or inside this local are the only signages that i was subject to a linguistic landscape study okay so we focus our attention as linguistic landscape researchers on the establishment first not on the individual sign because the danger here is if we focus on individual signs knowing that they come in great number we uh, are be we tend to be confused later on in the process and that we have like a lot of large number of signs to study okay so we try to um reconcile that matter by focusing first on signages in a certain one establishment now we also have another claim um though though that is actually the tip or the advice of other researchers in the field uh, there are a lot of queries and that's why i'm saying a while back that um the, it is quite something problematic for a linguistic landscape especially on choosing how much signboard signages will be studied and in what particular um parameter will be study the signages okay so the questions were raised from border back in 2006 uh, asking are the text on moving objects such as buses or cars to also be included when you study uh, the signages okay and other researchers would actually respond to that um, certain query by suggesting that we can move from the smallest individual sign to the level of an establishment okay now um that leads me now to asking this question what are the roles of photograph in linguistic landscape studies of course if we go out to the field and conduct linguistic landscape studies we need a physical literal materials okay and i think one of the most important materials that linguistic landscape researchers should be carrying is actually their um, mobile phones with um, cameras or of course uh, to also gather photographs of these different signages that they're going to analyze later on so the first one is to understand that photographs are actually a rich source of our linguistic landscape data okay so taking a picture does not require a lot of training especially not uh, when it is a photo of a fixed sign and fixed signs are still predominant in the genre of linguistic landscape photographs so uh, please do not be conscious when you're studying a linguistic landscape study you might be thinking that you have to be a professional photographer or a professional picture taker right in that sense but no um so long as the image can be captured clearly because those are your data later on for linguistic landscape analysis then i think that's the best step okay that's where we start the best okay you don't have to be a professional um photographer to qualify yourself in this particular um aspiration but so long as you know how to work with these image capturing devices and take clear photos and with the basic right angles then that would already be functional okay so since our photographs will be a rich source of our data for linguistic landscape studies we are going more technical here such as technical photography so for this particular thing we have to make sure that even if we're not professional photographers as i was saying a while back we still observe image quality which means to say that our images would not be blurred okay uh, there will be no low readability because we're dealing with signs here and signs would include texts okay so when we're taking a sign boards or signages because they are um variables of our study or our analysis Please make sure that even the textual information in the signages are being captured clearly by the 
fault, uh, fault by the image capturing device that we're using, such as a DSLR probably or a mobile camera, whatever that may be, please make sure that the textual information of the object we have photographed can still be readable and legible when printed, okay? At the same time, the transcript of a text that cannot be read should be avoided. Again, we take an image quality. Translations will also be taken a picture of because there are signages or signboards that actually have like, um, you know, you call it a, sci a subtitle or a translated text. Like this is written in the English language which, and then later on under it or side on it, side of it, actually have a translated, uh, a translation to another language, okay? In the Philippines, we have that, okay? Because um, we have like signages or signboards. There are two official languages in the country. And so um, this message, like uh, this message is written in the English language and later on it will be translated to our Filipino language, which are which is actually another national language in the country. So all these things will actually be a point of consideration in um, photographing our um, signages that will be used later on for our analysis in the linguistic landscape study. And of course, the images will be a part of the data and publication. The problem for some when they try to publish their studies about uh, linguistic landscapes to the end, and they present to the readers or their audiences the uh, samples of the photographs that are, that they've taken. But the audiences are left confused, okay, and uh, puzzled because on the printing of the um, signages that they've taken for this to be, they're not sure if the information in the research are really legitimate because the signages as samples that they've attached are not clear okay meaning to say maybe the image quality was compromised or was sacrificed when they're shooting the signages so for the purposes of better publication and readability of your readers and the audiences later on please make sure that we're using our devices to achieve image quality okay especially so that signages are our main ingredient in the linguistic landscape study. So there are a lot of models, principles, frameworks that are assistant to linguistic landscape studies. And the first one is what we have to call as preference model. And it was popularized by Spolsky and Cooper back in 1991, and of course, Jack and Dove back in 1983. So, according to these researchers, if we're using or if we are being guided by the preference model in linguistic landscapes, so assistant to understanding linguistic landscape is by Backhouse back in 2007, which is titled as the Comprehensive Monograph. Now, according to Backhouse, when you're approaching a linguistic landscape study, you have to know the source or the origin of the sign, okay? Who did, okay? Are there ordinances? Are there policies in this community that the only language or the yeah if that the only language that will be used in these signboards in public places will be this okay are there supporting policies for that are there supporting ordinances or rules in the community or do you think that uh, politically uh, the leaders of the community like the officials or um, yeah, the, the leaders or the officials in the community would have something to do with installing this language to be the medium in writing information on the signages because that's also possible, okay? Sometimes if we um, go deeper on analyzing linguistic landscapes, we can also investigate on 
the influence of the people who are seated in power because they also have a say on um, telling us what language will be used as a medium of uh, communication and information and our signages, okay? If that's gonna be taken on a political aspect. But uh, again, for comprehensive monograph, apart from the origin of the sign, the readers of the sign. It is actually very similar to the preference model of um, Spolsky and companies especially on the presumed reader there, is the same as the reader of a sign in the comprehensive monograph. Because we need to consider, if we'll try to investigate on the languages that are being used on our signboards or signages, um, we also have to consider who's gonna be the reader of the signages. Uh, what languages do these people in the community speak dominantly of okay so we need to figure those things out and of course dynamics of languages and scripts in contact okay so all these things are constraints of the comprehensive monograph we also have the meanings of science by placing by placement. So there is an idea given by Scholen and Scholen Wong back in 2003, the idea of geosemiotics. Now, when you say a geosemiotics, it is the study of a social meaning of the material placement of signs and discourses and of actions in the material world. Okay, so meaning to say it's going to be on the principles of layout okay so if you're talking about principles of layout uh normally for multi uh, multilingual um multilingual signages or sign words normally we will see that these language is on top okay of the signage and the rest of these languages are are on the bottom of it so one is on the lead and the others are are on the succeeding portions. That alone would actually be a point of query to us. Of all those languages that are presented on the signage, why did we, uh, why did the community use this language first and then followed by the other languages? So their placements also matter, and that's also a concern of geosemiotics, or probably in terms of layout, why is this language having a larger font size than all the languages on the signboard, okay? That would not be done intentionally. Uh, that would not just be done for aesthetic sake, but it was done intentionally to carry a certain meaning. What if this language that has the largest font size in the signboard would already denote or connote a dominance or prominence of the language in the community? That's why the, the font size would be more enlarged because people, when they see that and it's the dominant language in the community, people would immediately understand what the billboard or the signage says, okay? So those are uh, passable factors or passable reasons, but layout in geosemiotics will really be a concern. Okay. At the same time, geopolitical location. Okay. For geopolitical locations, the languages on a sign can index the community in which they were used. Of course, in the Philippines, our one of our national languages is Filipino. Okay. So if I see and I research on, I conduct an LL study on the public signages here in one of the cities in the Philippines, I would see that Tagalog or Filipino is one that's dominantly being used on the billboards or on the signages. Then definitely it would help me understand that uh, this is a representation of the people in the community and the language that is dominant to them. Therefore, it indexes, okay, the community in which they are being used to and in the community where people understand more, okay? And social cultural associations would mean that languages on a sign can symbolize an aspect of the product 
that is not related to the place where it is located okay so this ones are actually on the placement and another uh, principle is actually um devised by ben Raphael shohami amara and trumper hedge back in 1998 and 2006 and they call this principle as the social logical structuration principles okay so first one presentation of self okay there is a matter for uniqueness okay how is the signboard um lay layouted okay or or what unique features of the signboard may help us um understand it even more okay how is it connected to the community are there symbols that are representative of the community okay are there logos that were also integrated on the signboards and signages because they will also give give a meaning a certain meaning and we also have good reasons perspective where it is the anticipation of clients cost and benefit considerations instrumental and rational calculations we also have the collective identity markers of a group like what if this community is really multicultural and multilingual therefore our signages would logically have to provide us with a multilingual approach like using different languages on one signboard okay but not all um, signboards would have that expectation right so we need to dig deeper in investigating the language or the languages that are being used on a certain signboard and how does that connect to people and their linguistic and cultural identities okay we also have on the sociological structuration principles the power relations perspective. When you say it's power relations perspective, it's actually what language is dominant, what language is less dominant, or what language is more powerful or more common in the community. Although, uh, please have that corrected, there is no superior nor inferior language but the but the the science would actually tell us that there are dominant languages in a certain area and there are less dominant languages in the same area okay so um sometimes what is being dominantly spoken is uh, the language that dominates our sign boards on a certain community because again these signages will communicate to people and if this is the language that is dominant if this is the language that is dominant in the community ideally and logically this has to be the language that has to go first on the billboards on the signages on the signboards on the public notices okay so all these things will also be matters of query and investigations okay we also have have what um bloomert and uh, mali in 2014 call us the layers of meaning so when you say layers of meaning they actually posited the idea of the arrows and according to these researchers the first one is the background arrow it's pointing to the past that is the producers of the sign in a specific historical time and space and the conditions of production. We also have the forward arrow, which is pointing to the future. That is the addresses of the sign and the conditions for uptake. Sideways arrow, which points at the present, and that is at the specific emplacement of the sign among other sign and all these things ladies and gentlemen are actually part of our concerns in linguistic landscape studies okay so i think that's uh gonna be all that i'll be sharing to you i just kept it very basic because linguistic landscape i know would not be um super familiar to all of us but at least from these points of discussion we gain basic knowledge and 
familiarity as to how linguistic landscapes work in the field and of course to also encourage us to keep producing, generating and cultivating researches that are centered on linguistic landscape studies. But I also want to um, give um, the encouragement that linguistic landscape studies is interdisciplinary, okay? As you can see, if we're talking about signages, signboards, and we try to connect or correlate that to the community, we touch different aspects and different sectors. Therefore, not only English teachers, and it's not only the job of the linguist to generate or propagate studies on linguistic landscape, because it's going to be um, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary that we need a political aspects that we need to include social aspect that we need to include economical aspect as well in studying signages and signboards so i'm saying that when we conduct linguistic landscape studies in the future it would be best to collaborate with other people from different specializations and different disciplines because the more that we do that the more that we can assure the richer um richer composition of our data for language studies okay for linguistic landscape studies okay so thank you very much for listening thank you for the invitation and again i apologize for not making it physically with you today or personally with you today but i hope that my discussion on linguistic landscape was able to illuminate okay our uh, minds about this concept and encourage us to uh, contribute our linguistic landscape studies in the near future. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for the Institute of Global Professionals. And thank you to all my colleagues from all across the globe. Once again, this is Mr. Kevin Jake Morales Anyab, who has just spoken or lectured about linguistic landscape study all the way from the Pearl of the Orleans, the Philippines. Mabuhay, good evening, magandang gabi sa ating lahat, and thank you very much. Thank you everyone for watching and listening this recording video. Thank you so much. Now we are going to our quiz competition, and today our quiz code is ICT. The code is ICT. Let's we enjoy our quiz video. Dear participants, this is our quiz session time. You can join this session by slido.com. And after that, you have to enter the code, and the code is IGT. Then you can join this live quiz session. And top 10 quiz competition winners get their quiz certificate after this session from our official Facebook page. Our Facebook page address is Institute of Global Professionals. Now, 30 participants already joined with us. We start our quiz competition after one minute later. So, join the higher up and mention your friends in the comment box to join this live quiz session. To join this session, you have to 
go to chrome or any other browser after that you have to go to slido.com and enter the code the code is igt then you can join this live quiz session Let's see step about quiz competition. Our first question is: In the field of linguistic landscape, traffic signs belongs to regulatory discourages or infrastructural discourages. Option number one: Regulatory discourages is the right answer. Our next question is: Linguistic landscape can tell us something about ethnolinguistic disparity in a specific area. The statement is true or false? Question number one: The statement is true. Next question is: Linguistic anthropology studies language in its sociocultural and biological context. The statement is true or false? Option number one: The statement is true. Our next question is. In experiments, researchers give advice or treatment. Option number two, treatment is the right answer. Next question is. Research in which researcher attempts to determine the practical needs of those. The program will serve is called survey or needs assessment. Option number two, needs assessment is the right answer. Next question is. Popular customs most frequently originate in more developed countries or countries with large rural population. Option number one: more developed countries is the right answer. Our next question is. Technically advanced societies, there is likely to be a standard language or many basic language. Option number one, a standard language, is the right answer. Next question is: In a psychological research study, the population is the full group of research interests. Or the selected group to be studied during a research process. Option number one: the whole group of research interests are right items. 
the next question is research in comparative pol policies can be divided into these two categories is it north and south above or below the equator or quantitative and qualitative studies option number 2 quantitative and qualitative studies is the right answer the last question is what are advantages of an experimental research is it can control cause and effect or can determine cause and effect and can control confound Option number two is the right answer. Thank you, everyone. Now you are going to see our leader board. Thank you, everyone, for your active participation in this quiz session. And congratulations of our top 10 quiz competition winner. Top 10 quiz competition winners get their quiz certificate after this session from our official Facebook page. Our Facebook page address is Institute of Global Professional. Dear participants, uh, this is a record, recording session video, so we have no speakers, so we can play our question and answer session. Their participants to our program name is Research in Linguistic Landscape and to our certification code is IGP8777. The code is IGP8777. Dear participants, to download your e-certificate, you have to go to our website. Our website address is edugp.com. If you have not any account on our website, first of all, you have to create an account on our website. After that, you have to enroll today's program. And program name is Research in Linguistic Landscape. And after that, you have to enter the code. And the code is igp 8 Seven seven seven, and after that you can download your e certificate. And after downloading your e certificate, don't forget to celebrate with IGP session. Thank you everyone for your active participation in this session. I hope you learn something new from this recording video. Thank you everyone. Stay happy and stay safe.